Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing this morning? I'd like to welcome all of you to our service this morning, both here in person and online. Our first song this morning is going to be number 186. Number 186. We'll sing the first, third, and last verse. Number 186. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful. second and last verse and then we'll have our opening prayer. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Sing, O oh earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of 
eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellence. Most high and holy Father, we give our thanks for this beautiful day that you have given us, this opportunity that we have now to assemble together to sing songs of praise and to hear your word proclaimed. Holy Father, I ask your blessings and your guidance upon those here with us this morning, those that are with us online, that you open our hearts and our minds to your word, our lives to your service. Father, I ask your blessings on those that are sick of our number, those our family, our friends that are suffering with many different things, those that are suffering over newly made graves. Father, that if it would be your will, that they would return to their most wanted walks of life and that you would be the comfort that those need going through these times. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our many unforgiven sins and that we take heart and that we find courage in the, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross that we look to that cross with the hope and the peace and the comfort that it sheds upon us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we offer this prayer. Amen. Our next song is going to be number 545. 545. After this, we'll have our scripture reading, and let's sing first, second, and last verse. Number 545. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can feel at home in this world. Not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. 
Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world. Psalms 81, 10 through 13. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people around not hearken to my voice, and Israel would not none of me. So I gave them up into their own hearts, lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. Will, please mark in your songbook our song of invitation, which is number 718. 718. Once you get that marked, please turn to our song before the lesson, which is number 380. Once you get that marked, if you will, please stand. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth, and sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because Tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe. Beneath whose sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because he first loved me. Good morning. Good morning and welcome everyone once again to our services here at Euphora. It's uh, certainly great to look out and see you all this morning. I hope you were able to have a great weekend. Enjoy the beautiful weather that we had. Uh, I know I did. I had a great Saturday, Friday, Saturday with my family. And I hope you did the same as well. It was <coughs> so nice to be past ice and rain and, and have sunshine. And I can't tell you just how... Exciting that is to wake up and see a blue sky, warm day. But I can't express how excited I am now to be here with you. And I hope you are excited as well as we come together now to worship our God. Some of you may have heard the name before, Augusta Neliton. 
medical folks, I imagine, more so than others. Uh, Augustin Nelaton, he was an incredible French surgeon in the mid-1800s. Uh, he's the inventor of the catheter. Don't hold that against him. Uh, but a great surgeon. He was being interviewed, and he said something that stuck out to me because of its relevance today. He said, if I had only four minutes to perform a surgery that in a, a life truly depended on it, I just had four minutes, I would take one minute to think it through first. One out of the four minutes he would spend thinking, 25% of the time. How many today are the, are the jump right in first and think about it later? It, it seems as though this is the model of life. In fact, we had a, a, a little catchphrase coming up. I remember seeing pictures of, of Tyler uh, coming out of high school with the long hair. I imagine that was his, his motto, that YOLO. Were you a YOLO person? Yeah. You only live once, right? It, it, this live now, think later kind of thing. The pace of life is incredibly fast now, which makes things even more challenging. Struggles are growing and growing. So when it comes time to make a decision, are you one of the few that stop to take the minute and think it through or jump first? If you happen to be one of the few that stop and take that moment, and you're here today, so I tend to believe that is the case. You're somebody that stops and you think things through. What is it that sways your decision? What, what helps you decide your next step? Is it something that will make you money? Is it something that will make you look cool? Let me tell you, that got me in a lot of trouble. Is it based off of something like this? How far down the list of those questions do you have to get before you come to the point of saying, what would God think about this? What does God's word say about that? Is it pretty far down the list? Is it there at all? What would God say about this? Have we forgotten what life is really about these days? Because after all, isn't life about personal happiness? Isn't life about self-pleasure? Well, for self-centered, a self-centered idea, a self-centered mentality, that answer is yes. So as we get into our lesson this morning... I want to think about a comparison. And I want you to think about this as we go through. What does the Bible say about self-centered versus God-centered way of life? A life concerned with pleasing you or a life set on praising God? Now my goodness, are we dealing with this in our country today? It's something that has been brewing for some time now. We are moving further and further and further away from a God-centered life instead to a country focused on self-centeredness. And I think we would all say many things have changed from your childhood. My birthday is today. And I remember back to when I was a kid how different things were. Even more so for our older folks. I couldn't imagine what, child, what childhood was like for like Eddie. Think how different it is today than when I was a kid. We now live in a society behind a smoke screen. And this is where we are as a country today that says we must have, and it's given a fancy title, separation of church and state. You hear that all the time. It's, it's a clever smoke screen put out there. God must be removed from everything but church. And then even in a lot of churches, God is all but removed from there as well. God must be removed. For example, if you've heard this before, God has been removed from schools but encouraged in prisons. Is that not backwards? There was a time ago in school, even when I was a kid, where you started the day with a prayer. It wasn't uncommon for the teachers to read scripture. And then you would start the class. Day. You can't do that now. You can be sued for doing that now. Separation of church and state, we've got to have them separate. But you go back to our first president, George Washington. He said, it is impossible to rightly govern without what? God in the Bible. You look at the founding fathers, Thomason, Jefferson, Franklin. You look at Abraham Lincoln. They were commonly, they would commonly quote scripture. Now, the founding fathers, they might not have agreed on everything. They might not have been perfect examples of faith. But they agreed enough to know that the Bible is necessary 
to rightly govern life. But yet here we are today, 2021, pulling as far away from God as we possibly can. It's no longer about what pleases God. And instead it's what pleases man. What pleases man. So put that into context for us today. Put that into context with our Wednesday night Bible study that we've been going through for some time now. How did that mentality work out for Israel, for example? How did that mentality work out for Judah? Well, we're going to find out in the next couple of weeks. What about other prosperous nations that once were? What about Babylon, Greece, Persia, Rome? How did that mentality work out for them? Where are they today? Where are those great world powers today? And then I think about something the psalmist said. Psalmist 9, verse 7. Psalm 9, verse 7. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. Where are those great nations today? Is our country in danger of forgetting God? Are the faithful staying quiet on matters of faith, of living, and instead just trying to get along, go along, fit in? And the hard question we're going to look at today as well, is there anything we can do to help the situation? Is there anything we can do to help? So the first thing I'm going to look at this morning is our nation's moral depravity. Now, moral depravity sounds like a fancy term. I don't want you being thrown off by that. Moral depravity means a voluntary violation of morals, values, customs, um, any way of that life that is a sinful type lifestyle. It's a voluntary uh, violation of these things. It's a choice to live a certain way with no regard to the consequences for them. That's what moral de uh, depravity means. Have we forgotten our morals? When you watch the news, do you think we have forgotten our morals? Have we forgotten the one that made the guidelines? The one that set the rules? And I've heard it said this way. If you don't like the way the rules are set, then you have an opportunity. You have an option before you now. You can go and you can create your own universe in which you can set the rules and the guidelines. And if you have the ability to do that, I would say go for it. Can you do that? Well, no, how long have we been trying to get life on Mars and we can't do it? So what about the one that says, this is the rule, these are the ways, and yet choose not to listen to the word of God? And I think about our scripture reading that Levi read for us a moment ago. And I think about something we talked about last week, when Jesus condemned Jerusalem. He gave Jerusalem a death sentence. But what did he say in the process? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that you would have listened. I wanted to bring you into me. You wouldn't do it. Now compare that to what Levi read in Psalm 81. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But listen to what the people choose to do instead. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. Should we change Israel to America? So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels and listen to what is said in verse 13. Tell me, this doesn't sound just like Jesus condemning Jerusalem. Oh, that my people would listen to me. That Israel would walk in my ways. I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. Wow. How much of the Old Testament is filled with examples of what we're talking about right here? Noah preached for 100 years, and the people didn't listen. They wanted to go about it their own way instead, and how did it work out for them? The people in the wilderness with Moses heard him speak for 40 years, and they didn't listen. They made golden calves instead. They said, there's no way we could take the Canaanite people. They're too big, too strong for us. And so they're made to wonder because of it. The nations heard the prophets, but they wanted to kill them instead, even though they were sent. To be a voice of deliverance. They weren't going to listen. Time after time, people ignored God's word. Guess where those people are today? What do they choose instead? 
What choice did they make? They chose a self-centered, self-pleasing lifestyle over a God-centered lifestyle. And God says, oh, that my people would listen to me. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go my way instead. I'm not going to listen. Think about the book of Joshua for a moment. Joshua is a great example, and we're going to do a lot of jumping, so I didn't want to put the text on here. But I want you to think about Joshua for just a moment. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua assumes the mantle of leadership for Moses. Moses has died. He has been buried in the mountains. Joseph, uh, Joseph, Joshua has now become the leader of the Israelite people, and God comes to him with a message. And what had to be a monumental task for him the way of life has changed. People have looked at Moses for 40 years. And now it's Joshua. And he comes to Joshua. And the Lord says, I will be with you wherever you go. And under Joshua, things went very well. We get to a well-known verse in Joshua 22, verse 15, where Joshua charges the people, the Israelite leaders. And he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Will it be God of your fathers, or will it be the God of the Ammonites? Will it be these pagan gods? You're going to choose today who you will serve. And what did the people say? What did all these people say? Far from us to do this. Far from us to turn from God. We recognize who God is. We're not going to do that. We won't do anything like that, they tell Joshua. We're going to be God-centered people, in other words. Yet we go from an encouraging book like Joshua... And one page of a turn to the book of Judges and you find how far the people have fallen. One page. And the book of Judges ends with a verse that sums it up. You couldn't sum it up any better. Judges 21 verse 25. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Because it was no longer about being God-centered. And they told Joshua, far be it from us to do something like this. We're not going to turn from God. Now go back to what the psalmist wrote. The people did not listen, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. Judges 21, 25. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Let's talk about our nation for a moment. Let's talk about America. Did you know that over the last 50 years there has been a 900% increase and cohabitation without marriage? 900%. Why? Because marriage is a piece of paper. It doesn't matter anymore. It's not an institution formed by God from the beginning of the world, when in fact, it's the oldest institution formed by God. So we get excited about decreasing divorce rates, when in reality, they're decreasing because marriage rates are decreasing. And we get to a verse like Hebrews 13, verse 4, and we have to ignore that now. Because Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But that doesn't fit the mold today, so we have to ignore that. We have statistics from the last decade that tell us that almost 10% of the adult population drink enough alcohol to be considered alcoholics. A 2015 study showed an average of 100,000 deaths per year because of it. I imagine we've all heard about the major problems in our country today with opioids. I remember hearing about this town in Ohio, and I meant to ask Lakin about it. If she had, if she, I couldn't find the name of the actual town, but I remember hearing about it, and all I could find was state statistics. But a state so plagued with this crisis that the morgue had no more room for bodies. They had to bring in refrigerated trailers, storage units, to hold the bodies because they were falling so fast. People. People with work falling so fast. Nearly 10% of the U.S. population struggles with depression, 40% with some form of anxiety. And that was before COVID. In 2019 alone, there was an estimated 1.3 million suicide attempts. And at least 47,000 died from suicide. But aren't we a country moving forward in freedom of self-expression? You can live now however you want, regardless of what the Bible says. We've legalized homosexuality, we, we, uh, homosexual marriages, even though the Bible is clear on it. We celebrate divorce instead of couples really trying. We've elevate, elevated the whole LGBTQ platform. You can look at the transgender movement today. 
And my question to you is simple. When you hear statistics like what I just read, and I would encourage you, do not take my word for any of the statistics you heard me read. Go look them up. Verify. But when you hear those, what do those tell you about the direction we're headed? Aren't we moving forward? Aren't we getting better? More open-minded? And I hope that those statistics makes you as nervous as it makes me because just like what we read in Psalms, just like what we read in Judges, the people are lost in the world and they don't care. Many people are headed for hell and it's in the name of self-centeredness. We're not worried about it. Romans chapter 1 reads a lot like what you would find in a news article today. If you're going to go pull a New York Post uh, article, it's going to read a lot like what we're about to talk about in Romans chapter 1. And I want you to think about how much of it describes our society. I've got verse 28 through 32 on the screen. Turn there with me to Romans chapter 1, so I'm actually going to back up to verse 24. Romans 1, I want to start in verse 24. And I want you to listen how Paul is describing these people. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, tell me if this doesn't sound familiar, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passion, for their women exchanged natural relations for those who are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree about those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now tell me that passage is not telling Tell me that passage does not sound a lot like what takes place today. See, Paul wrote these people that they knew God's word. Many people today know God's word. They understood their sin meant death. But listen to what he says. They don't care. They don't care that that's what it meant. They weren't concerned about that fact. They were concerned with self instead. But does something like that, and I want to get to this point, does something like that ever leave them satisfied? I think about how many stories I've heard over the years of a person that came from nothing. And it really is a good story in the beginning. They came from nothing and they made it. They became millionaires, um, musicians, actors, athletes. They came from nothing. All of a sudden they have it all. And they take their life. They take their own life down the road. The money wasn't enough. Happiness, peace, hope, it's not found in money, although that's the common thought. Happiness isn't found in the bottom of some bottle, even though deaths are piling up left and right. It's not found in possessions or anything like it. Only misery comes from those. For time's sake, I'm not going to have you turn there. I, I didn't want to get to jumping too much, but jot down Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And as you get some time, I want to encourage you uh, later on to go back and read this because Solomon is teaching a very important lesson for us all, one that couldn't be more relative to our society today. Can you find true happiness in stuff like this? Well, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon is describing the power, the prestige that he had, all the gardens and the parks that he built, the male, the female servants that he had, the sheer volume of incredible possessions he owned, the things of Solomon cannot be matched by people. That's how abundance. He had it all. Yet we get to a verse, like verse 17 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and Solomon wrote, and I hated life. Solomon wrote, I hated life. 
And what you will find when you read throughout this chapter, and I hope you will go back and do that because it's a very telling chapter, is that he realizes that if you don't have God, that it's worth nothing. Now, I wish this is something he would have remembered. And there are a lot of people that say this book is his repentance. We don't really know that. But at least here he understood this. That without God, you have nothing. The meaning of life isn't about being self-centered. It's about being God-centered. And we know from reading about Solomon, Solomon forgot that. And so he talks about all these great things that he had, and he ends it by saying, and I hated life. I had it all, and I hated life. Here we are chasing the same things that Solomon had, only to be filled with the same disappointment. And you can watch it happen. Turn on the news and watch it. The further we turn from God in our country today, the worse it gets. So we come to the inevitable question, because I'll be honest with you, just in giving this sermon, it sounds awfully negative, doesn't it? Are you going to leave encouraged right now? Uplifted? Ready to go? So we're going to come to the inevitable question. What can I do? What can I do about it? At times as Christians we begin to feel overwhelmed. I mean, it's a big problem. What can little old me do about it? I'm just one person. The news is depressing. Government's disappointing. It just seems to be stacking up. I know a lot of Christians that have gotten down over this, have gotten upset. But what I want to do in this, this final time today, I want to tell you why that shouldn't be the case. I want to tell you why I'm not down and out, for instance, and why I'm not sad and I'm not running for the hills today. As bad as it is when I turn on the news. Because I think about something we studied several weeks ago in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. Turn over there for just a moment. We're not going to look at many passages for time's sake, but I want to look at a couple. 2 Kings chapter 6. The Syrians have encompassed the city of Dothan, and they're doing it for purpose. They're trying to get rid of Elisha. Elisha has been spooling their plans. God has been giving Elisha what the Syrians are doing. He's going and reporting it. He's spoiling their plans. And so this Syrian army have encompassed Dothan with a great and tremendous army, all with a single purpose of getting rid of Elisha. What in the world could the prophet do to stop them? You talk about a down and out type situation. What is he going to do to stop them? Elisha's servant is afraid, and rightly so, you might add. But I want you to notice what happens. And I hope this encourages you as much as it does me. And it, it helps build you up if you're feeling down and out about situations today. They're surrounded. Keep that in mind. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. When the servant of the man of God, is talking about Elisha, rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, this servant, and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Do not be afraid, Elisha told this service. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Are you kidding me? That doesn't get your blood boiling at all? Because when the servant thought there was no chance, there's no way, there's no hope, what can we do about it? His eyes were open and he saw it. And what was it he saw? He looked on the mountains and he saw an army of fire, of chariots, of horses. He saw that there was more with them than against them. He didn't know it. At times it may not feel like it. At times it may not look like it. With God, you are the majority. Even if the world is piling up against you, you are the majority. You're not alone in this feeling. Jesus gave his disciples what had to have seemed like an impossible task at the time. To a bunch of fishermen, nonetheless, to a bunch of regular common folks, certainly not scholars, not until the Apostle Paul comes around. We know the commission given. Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus told them, Go unto all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. He gives them this commission. Yet they're in the same nation that just killed Jesus. 
They saw what happened when you tried to do this. And now Jesus just told these regular folks, you're going to go to all the world and you're going to do this. What a mountain that had to have been for them to climb. But he didn't stop at verse 19. Notice what he says in verse 20. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When we take a moment to remember that, just a single moment like Dr. Nellerton did in the very beginning, just one minute of the four to think before we jump, suddenly the mountain is as high to climb. Suddenly happiness doesn't come from possessions. It's not about bottles or worse. And we learned the lesson that Solomon taught. Without God, nothing else matters. So what can you do today in a world that seems perfectly fine, heading down a road, a pathway to destruction? Live your life. Seek to honor God in your life. Live in a way that people see God's grace in you. They don't see anxiety and depression. They don't see worry and fear. Instead, they see the peace that passes all understanding. That's what they see when they see you. I think about something Peter wrote, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Why do you have hope today? Can you explain it if someone asks you? I want to leave you with this this morning. And I hope it's something that you'll think about. As a Christian in a world that seems so dark today, stop asking, what can I do? I'm just one person. What can I do? And instead, start saying to yourself, watch what God can do. It's not what can I do. Watch what God is going to do. Live showing the peace and the comfort that you have. Be willing to explain the hope and the happiness that you find. And pray for those not experiencing it today. A harder challenge. Pray for the leaders of this nation. Even when you don't want to. Pray for those that are focused on self only and don't see the errors of their way. Pray for the faithful that have gotten discouraged. In the end, it's not much of a comparison at all when you think about it. Self-centered people will get the best they can get now. God-centered people know the best is coming. If you're not a child of God this morning, this is your time. If you've not experienced the true peace from having your sins washed by the blood of Christ, then in a moment, Jesse is going to lead us in an invitation song. And I want to encourage you to heed that call. If you believe the word of God and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you're ready to repent of your sins, turning from that old life that once stained you, then I want to encourage you to be baptized this morning in a watery grave just as Jesus was placed in a borrowed grave. Arrive to walk in the newness of life, experiencing what the world is longing for, what the world is searching for, but will never find. If you are a child of God this morning, but you have fallen away, maybe the troubles of this world have gotten you down, then this invitation is for you as well. We'd love to pray for you, pray with you, and whatever you have need of this morning. Whatever we can do for you, this is your time. Come now as the rest of us stand and sing this invitation song. Who at the door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I
for the Lord's Supper. Our next song is going to be number 167. everyone have their for the Lord's Supper? All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day and for the many opportunity and blessings that you give us. Uh, especially now, we want to thank you for this opportunity we have to uh, gather around this table and to reflect back upon your son's death upon the cross. Uh, we pray that as each one of us partakes of this bread, that we would do so in a manner as well pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, again, let's bow. Once again, Heavenly Father, as we come to Thee again, thanking You for Your Son, we pray for His shed blood upon the cross. We pray for those that, for us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents His blood, that we will do so in a manner that's pleasing Your sight. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Also at this time, aside and separate from the Lord's Supper, we have the uh, communion plates, or uh, I mean the collection plates is in the back. And uh, if you haven't already uh, given an offering, you, if, when this service is over, you can drop it in the collection plate in the back. But at this time, let's, we're going to have a prayer also for that. Heavenly Father, again, as we're coming to thee, we want to thank you for all the many blessings of this earth that you do give us in this life. Uh, we pray that you, as we uh, enjoy the fruits that you give us, that we will give a part back to thee that you've given to us. And 
pray that these funds will be taken and that your word would be uh, further throughout this community and on out through the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll go ahead and warn you this morning that uh, my list was so long she had to write it on a separate page. So. Uh, a few announcements to go over this morning. There will be a men's business meeting following uh, services today. Uh, so men, make sure you remember that. Hang around for a few moments after services. Uh, next Sunday, March 14th, will be the diaper and wipes drop-off for Mandy Sally. Uh, so make sure you remember that. She has an Amazon registry available. Uh, so make sure you Remember those dates. That will be next week. Also, as Will announced for us last week, um, this the stuffed animals that we did for the police department is something we're going to continue. So make sure if you would like to contribute to help with that. Uh, if you have stuffed animals you want to bring, if you'd like to pick up some to drop off, please do so so we can continue that uh, community involvement project. Tucker Burns, uh, who is Kathy Norwood's grandson, he is sick, so let's remember him and our thoughts and prayers. Emily Chancellor, who is a friend of Ellie's, uh, she didn't get the report that they wanted. They're going to be discussing more options. Um, uh, let's remember her. She's, she's had a, a rough go here lately. Uh, Betty Duncan is going to have a doctor's appointment Wednesday uh, with surgery following on Thursday. So let's remember Betty. Let's remember Philip and the family and... and Hope everything goes well. Remember the Ellington family. I know most everyone is familiar with that already. Um, uh, heartbreaking uh, what happened to the family as the uh, father and two kids were killed in a car wreck. So remember them. Uh, their funeral will be tomorrow the 8th at the Presbyterian Church of Oxford. So let's remember that family. It's, they're going to have a long road ahead. So let's remember them in our prayers. Uh, Amy Hunt, his grandfather, passed away yesterday. So let's remember Amy and the uh, rest of the family in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, uh, one good, I say one good note, a good note on here. Uh, Don Knacker, who we have been talking about for the last few weeks and been praying for, it was found that he did not have cancer, and that he had surgery to remove the mass on Thursday and was able to breathe on his own on Friday. So some good news there. Uh, Miss Larry Day has a doctor's appointment on Thursday, so let's remember her and hope everything goes well. Uh, let's also remember the family of Diane Crutchfield. We've mentioned her the last couple of weeks. She's a friend of Ruth's. She passed away from colon cancer on the 5th, so let's remember the family of the Crutchfields. Our funeral is tomorrow at the Baptist Church in Bell Fountain at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock tomorrow at Bell Fountain. I remember the family of Edna Richards of Eupora. Uh, she passed away on the 3rd, uh, so let's remember them. And then the family of Kevin Stewart, uh, Stewart who also passed away on the 3rd. Uh, any announcements before the birthdays? And I brought uh, the new bulletins from Pine Vale and put them out front for people. Everybody needs to get one. Okay. Some people may get it mailed to your house. So if anybody would like the updated Pineville bulletin, it's in the back. Uh, make sure you get one if, if you hadn't had one mailed to the house. Uh, no anniversaries to mention. We do have three birthdays this week. Uh, mine is today. David Dabbs is tomorrow on the 8th, and Jennifer and Judy Beck on the 13th. Are there any other announcements that need to be made before we have our closing song and Philip leads us in a closing prayer? If not, just... Our closing songs number 474. 474. We'll sing the first and last verse, and if you will, please stand. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toil that funded it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessings for my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let 
happy, fondly dream of his gold and glory of his early gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low till the shadows